So let me open in prayer and then we'll jump in here. Father, we bow before you this morning with thankful hearts for the mercies that you show to us in so many ways. Thank you for uh, health. Uh, thank you that you have spared to a large degree uh, our assembly from uh, what could be called the ravages of, of this pandemic, but we do uh, want to express our gratitude even without pandemics. and. Uh, we live in a, a world that is filled with snares, filled with danger, and it's because of sin that is in the world. And so we, uh, in some sense, enjoy confessing our sin, just acknowledging that uh, we are broken creatures and you have mended us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending your son uh, thank you for the love that you exhibited towards sinners like us by sending him to die for our sins and to take upon himself uh, the punishment for our sins so that we might not have to bear the penalty ourselves. We're grateful for that. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. We do pray for um, Wanda and her family that you give uh, healing comfort to her uh, based on the truth of your promises uh, in your word. And we pray for others. Uh, other, there are many in our assembly who need prayer and who are suffering for one reason or another. And so we pray for them uh, and thank you for this class and now for our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, will you please bless uh, the ministry of the word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're in uh, chapter 5 of, of the Gospel of Matthew, and we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to, I know it's been five months, I'm not going to uh, try to get you up to speed, uh, so to speak, of, of what the sermon, amount, sermon on the Mount is all about. I think most of you are familiar with the sermon and don't require that. But in, in our last lesson, surely you remember, uh, we read and studied uh, verses 17 through 20, and I titled that lesson, Christ and the Law. And by the way, there are outlines out in the uh, uh, foyer if, if you'd like one. Uh, so I, I titled that last lesson, Christ and the Law. I could have chosen instead Christ and the Scriptures, because in those few verses, the Lord affirmed to his followers his belief that the scriptures were completely inerrant, uh, those scriptures that were in existence in his day. And you can see today, perhaps, if you have an outline, uh, the title for these following verses is similar, Jesus Interprets the Law. And we'll carry that main idea through the remaining verses of chapter 5, dealing first with the sixth and seventh commands contained in the Ten Commandments prohibiting murder and adultery. So Jesus will interpret the law here, and when he has completed his sermon, the crowd who heard him will express amazement at what they had heard, certainly, but above all, they will marvel at the authority with which he delivered it. It was the kind of authority that one senses from one who not only commands the content of his message, but who speaks as if he is its author. And the standard of righteousness that he had laid out for them was almost equally shocking. Uh, they were accustomed to being held to an external standard of righteousness. Uh, what the scribes and the Pharisees, their religious leaders, did was to focus on the letter of the law. And so they developed these systems of interpretation of the moral law of God that restricted its commandments and extended its permissions. Uh, so they desired, what they wanted to do was ease the burden of compliance with the law. Uh, as John Stott observed, they made the law's demands less demanding and the law's permissions more permissive. But what Jesus did was expound the true meaning and intent of God's law. And as you know, he employed a certain formula 
that drew on the rabbinical system of citing previous authorities. And our passage today begins with that formula in verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, but I say to you. And again, look there in verse 27. You have heard that it was said in verse uh, 31 and verse 33 and 38 and lastly 43 you have heard that it was said but I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so there are six illustrations he gives of the greater righteousness that you and I the Christian uh, are called to the Jewish authorities had reduced God's law to a system of external compliance to the letter of the law, but what Jesus taught was that the only righteousness acceptable to God was a divine and internal one that comes straight out of our hearts. And so for today, we'll see his first two illustrations. Uh, for centuries, the scribes and Pharisees had taught that the way to keep the sixth commandment against murder was to simply not murder anyone. Uh, but Jesus interprets it more broadly to say that if you even hate someone or show contempt uh, for another, you've broken the commandment. Likewise, the scribes had taught that a person kept the seventh commandment against adultery uh, merely if he did not commit the physical act with another person's another with another person's wife or husband but Jesus revealed that to even lust after another in one's mind and heart was to break the commandment so you see the difference but now let's read uh, the verses beginning in verse 21 we'll read through verse 30 you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right hand makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So Jesus is selecting these individual commands that his disciples were familiar with, uh, using them as illustrations to point to the true nature of obedience to them. There is more to it than external conformity. There must be true heart obedience. And that was a recurring theme of the Lord's in Mark chapter 7. Uh, the issue in his interaction with the scribes and Pharisees there was the ritual washing of hands. Uh, they had become agitated, I know you remember this, because Jesus' disciples were not following the tra traditions regarding hand washing. But Jesus called them hypocrites, uh, quoting from Isaiah to accuse them of honoring God only with their lips while their heart is far away from God. He said they were actually neglecting the commandment of God, instead holding to the tradition of men 
And later in the chapter, he expanded on that thought, saying there is nothing outside the, the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things that proceed out of the man are what defile the man. And that's what we see illustrated in our passage. A true Christian morality must arise from our heart. And the first precept the Lord offers up is the prohibition against murder. He says, you've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. And that introductory phrase, you have heard that the ancients were told, is one possible translation. Uh, the more literal way of saying that would be that it was told to the ancients. But it could also be translated, it was told by the ancients. I think it's more likely he was referencing what had been told to the people over the years by the men of old, because he is taking aim at the standard practice of the historic rabbinical teaching to manipulate the edicts of the law to their own advantage, as for example in verse 43, look there, where they had added of their own accord to the command in the book of Leviticus to love one's neighbor, the further imperative to hate one's enemy. That was an addendum of sorts. And so he corrects there what had been told them by their ancient scribes. They were instead to love their enemies and pray for them. He is correctly interpreting precepts that were issued in the law, but that had been modified by their teachers to make them more acceptable and, and easy to keep. And they did that in this case by taking the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, and immediately combining it with a similar command found in Numbers 35, verse 30, which reads, if anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death, or as the Lord paraphrases it here, be liable to the court. And what that clever little combination did, in effect, was restrict the commandment against murder to merely the taking of a physical life. And that, in effect, relieved them of the responsibility to guard their heart against hatred or contempt of another. They could be satisfied, they could be perfectly happy in the delusion that they had fulfilled the law merely by not shedding another's blood and that they were therefore righteous. But the original commandment was more penetrating of human behavior than that. Uh, the old covenant law forbidding murder was not satisfied merely by a person refraining from spilling another person's blood. It pointed rather to a, the more fundamental problem, one person's vilifying anger against another person. And the Lord highlights that by piling one hostile attitude upon another, multiplying examples to drive the lesson home, what Don Carson described as, he's a preacher who makes his point and then makes his hearers feel its weight. He confronts his audience. Verse 22, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing shall be guilty. Whoever says you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. You think you're innocent of murder? Have you ever gotten angry with someone for no good cause? I say no good cause because of course there is such a thing as righteous anger, but Jesus is clearly not thinking of that. This is unrighteous anger springing from, we all know it, springing from envy or selfish offense or frustration or slight or any of the myriad uh, trivial experiences we endure each day. You think you're innocent of, of murder? Have you ever called a companion you good for nothing? Probably not, but that's what, that's that Greek word raka that you see in your margin, but really taken from the Aramaic reka, meaning something like empty-headed. I think if the Lord were with us now uh, teaching us, he might ask if, 
you've ever called anyone an idiot. Or my personal favorite, dolt. <laughs> which normally takes place behind the wheel of the vehicle. <laughs> you dolt. But it betrays a contemptuous attitude toward others. When, as we all know from the Beatitudes, think back, what marks a Christ follower is meekness. Not a lot of meekness going on in my vehicle day to day. The third form of murder that Jesus suggests is to call someone a fool. It is to assess another person in the pejorative, which can only come from a false sense of superiority. We should hasten to say that some persons really are fools, uh, but it's not our place to render judgment against them. There's a great illustration of this in the life of David when he encountered a true fool in Nabal. Uh, Nabal was a fool, as his wife uh, admitted. It was what the Hebrew Nabal meant. Nabal is his name and folly is with him, is what Abigail told David there in 1 Samuel. And by intervening the way Abigail did, she kept David from what? From murdering Nabal. Uh, David said to her, Blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. He called Nabal, you fool. And it was the heart attitude that was leading David to murder. Now, we're often guilty of all these type things, becoming angry and lashing out with contempt, calling another person an adult or a fool, and yet we fall short of actually shedding their blood. I don't want to shed their blood. I just want to get them to get out of the way. But Jesus <laughs> is interested, Jesus is interested in my heart, in your heart. In a man's heart, he is wishing, in a sense, the other person dead. As John would later say in 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. John learned that from Jesus, who goes on to say here in verse 22 that such a person shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Jesus believed in hell. He preached it more than any of the teachers of the Bible. Uh, now it's been quite a few months ago, Dan uh, preached or taught a lesson on hell in the East Parlor. If you missed that lesson, you should go back. I'd suggest you go back and listen to it. Uh, Dan struggles to define hell as we all do because it's horrible and, and it's frightening. The figure the Lord used here was the Gehenna of fire. Fiery hell is a, is a good translation. Whatever hell is like, it's to be compared with a never-ending valley of fire that engulfs one. The scribes and the Pharisees, by narrowing down what constitutes murder in the eyes of God, were, as Jesus would later say, making them twice as fit for hell as they were. And therefore, Jesus now goes on to say in verse 23, if anger and contempt toward others is such a grave offense, we must avoid them at all costs. Avoid them like the plague. Take action as speedily as possible. And he gives two illustrations. The first is of a pious Jew going to the temple to present an offering when he remembers there is unresolved conflict with another. Verse 23, therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. And we'll get to the second uh, illustration in a moment, but we should quickly note that the issue there about an, uh, an opponent at law is similar. There's some kind of unreconciled grievance between two people that lingers in the air in such a way 
that is detrimental to both of them. There is a heart anger that is at the root of each. Well, this was no small matter to our Lord, and we should take note of that because he said something similar to this in Mark chapter 11 in the context not simply of worship, but of prayer. And you'll remember this passage as well. In verse 25 of Mark 11, he is advocating for the power of prayer and how God will grant your prayer requests when offered in faith when Jesus suddenly issues a condition. If you have anything against anyone, forgive them first and then see your prayer answered. If you don't forgive, Jesus says, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. Well, here in our sermon, uh, the context is not prayer, it's worship. We can fashion it, though, into a more modern scenario by thinking of undertaking an observance of the Lord's Supper. Let's do that. If you're coming into a meeting where you're about to partake of the Lord's Supper, we're about to do that in, in, in several minutes, and you remember your brother has something against you, in effect, forget the Lord's Supper, go first, be reconciled to your brother, and then come partake of the Supper. And again, you can see how important this must be to the Lord when you observe that he wasn't suggesting that you first amend a wrong that you have committed against a brother. It's simply a situation in which you know that he has something against you and it's suddenly brought to mind. Uh, this is an important distinction and very practical to the relationships we have with each other. It also offers a lesson in the need for reconciliation with God. There is a responsibility incumbent upon one who would follow after Jesus. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. There is a responsibility incumbent upon that person to tend to a disruption in the relationship between himself and another brother or sister in Christ, no matter who is to blame for it. Jesus says, be reconciled to your brother. He does not say, uh, put away your own anger or resentment. If that were the case, uh, that you have malice in your heart because of what another has done to you, then in Jesus' example, the worshiper would be in the exact place he needed to be, at the altar, offering the sacrifice prescribed in acknowledgement of his own sin. But Jesus instead is requiring the worshiper to do something different than that. It is to first leave the altar and attempt to remove whatever ground of estrangement or alienation there exists on the part of the other brother or sister. The lesson is one of the primacy of heart obedience over ritualistic religion. Now, we rightly emphasize the importance of the spiritual disciplines. Uh, like reading the scriptures regularly and praying and not forsaking the assembling together of the saints, the observance of the ordinances of the church, the things uh, prescribed for us like we are engaged in uh, this morning. But all of these things that we're doing uh, can be, become mere pretense and, and even hypocrisy if we engage in them while knowingly carrying unresolved and unattended conflict with a brother or sister in Christ. And when that is the case, Jesus is essentially saying, forget the worship service. Go be reconciled to your brother. That's why I labeled this in the outline, escapist religion. It is a, it's scary because we've all been guilty of it, but it's a, it's a subtle thing. But it, it can snare one's sanctimonious soul uh, to set aside in our minds a lingering personal fissure with another person by busying ourselves with the formalities of religion. That's escapist religion. The Lord looks at the heart, and we should too. And so that's that's the lesson. 
But now I want to very quickly issue something of a side note about a truth that is inferred here, and I wouldn't mention it if I didn't think it was very important. Uh, John Murray, the great and gifted Scottish theologian and exegete who taught at Westminster Seminary in the mid-20th century, wrote a very careful and also quite popular book called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. And I know many of you in this room have read that uh, book. In his chapter on the nature of the atonement, he explains the biblical idea of reconciliation. And he explores these few verses in the Sermon on the Mount in order to do that. Of course, he's writing about the need for reconciliation between God and man, and not between man and man. But he identifies the important elements that belong to this most beautiful of doctrines, reconciliation. First, he emphasizes the existence of a grievance between the two. In Jesus' illustration, we're not told who's at fault. Perhaps both persons are, but it's not clear. But in our relationship with God, we know the source of the grievance. It is we who have offended God. The second thing is the necessity for the grievance to be removed. And that's why the brother at the altar, Jesus says, must take the initiative to go and effect reconciliation. The brother has something against him. So there's this enmity between the two, and the enmity must be removed. The reconciliation uh, effects the removal of this against. And so when we ponder the enmity between ourselves and God, the focus inevitably must be not upon our enmity, which must be reconciled, follow me here, uh, that, that's not what we must focus on, our enmity, but upon the alienation in the mind of the one with whom the reconciliation must be made. It is the alienation of God from us, His holy enmity by which we are alienated from Him. And here is the beautiful thing, the point I'm getting to, and the reason I take this side route, it's that, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, our great God and Savior has accomplished the reconciliation Himself, not counting our trespasses against us. God Himself in His own Son has removed the ground of offense, and we receive the re reconciliation. He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. God effected the reconciliation in the sacrifice of His own Son. And that in turn gave to us, as you know, our own ministry of reconciliation. So reconciliation is important to God. That's what Jesus is saying. As He spoke these words, uh, the urgency was always at the forefront of His thinking, for that was the purpose for which he had come. It's urgent to effect reconciliation, and that's the meaning behind the Lord's second illustration about a person's enemy at court in verses 25 and 26. It's fairly self-explanatory. If you don't make friends quickly with your enemy, you may bear the terrible consequences. But now beginning in verse 27, the Lord offers His second interpretation of the law. It concerns the seventh of the Ten Commandments, the law against adultery. Verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So according to Jesus, Lust is the equivalent of adultery, just as anger is the equivalent of murder. But he was only reflecting the teachings of the Scriptures as a whole. The Bible teaches chastity before marriage and fidelity after marriage. 
But the Pharisees had taken the seventh commandment and restricted it to that physical act itself. Like in John chapter 8 with the woman caught in adultery. You remember they hauled her in before Jesus in front of everybody and accused her of being uh, caught in, in adultery. In the very act, they said, there in John chapter 8. But where they restricted the command, Jesus instead expands it. He extends it to lustful looks and, and imaginings. And that makes everyone a, a bit un, uncomfortable. Just as in the case with anger. It's easy to have a sense of self-righteousness when you've limited what the offense consists of. Well, I've never murdered anyone. I've never committed adultery. But notice this. Jesus has, in effect, taken the seventh... I do want you to notice this. He's, he's taken the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, and he has combined it with the tenth commandment, not to covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, the command says. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. We can commit murder with our words, and we can commit adultery in our hearts when we desire something that belongs to another. And that's the crucial difference. Uh, the Lord Jesus was making no attempt to deprive either man or woman from the normal and God-given attractions and desires that are divinely bound up in marriage. That's natural and to be treasured and enjoyed. There's a reason that the Song of Solomon is in the Word of God. God created man and women, woman for the love and companionship of which sexual relations are an integral part. But Jesus is addressing the abuse of the natural by seeking it outside the covenant of marriage. To lust after a woman who is not your wife is more than just admiring a beautiful woman. It is to covet what is not given to you by God. And we know the difference, guys, uh, between looking and lusting. Uh, Luther knew it too in his own inimitable way. Uh, he captured that difference when he said, we cannot prevent the birds flying over our heads, but we can prevent them from making nests in our hair. Of course, this has great relevance today. We live in a sex-drenched society in which adultery and illicit sex are flaunted and used for every means imaginable, from selling soap to marketing technology. It's ridiculous. Jesus wasn't trying to prohibit the normal attraction between men and women. He was identifying as sin the kind of rapacious, selfish, lust that enslaves a person and makes his imagination run riot and commit adultery in his heart. Pornography is a satanic scourge on our society. I think we all realize that. It is a mirror on the cancer of our society's sin. And so we must not forget the subject here in the Sermon on the Mount is righteousness. That's verse 20. Let's go back to it. Our righteousness must surpass that of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees had lost sight of the seriousness of sin. By thinking of sin only in terms of lists of sinful acts, they had in effect trivialized sin and put an artificial protective shield around themselves. But sin is not a list of prohibited acts. It is a condition of the heart. There's a verse in the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy. It's verse 29. Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Amazing verse. You know the Ten Commandments are repeated uh, to the people in the book of uh, Deuteronomy in De Deuteronomy chapter 5. They're on the verge of entering the promised land 
and the people have stood there and proclaimed their intention to perform all that the Lord has told them to do. That's what they say. We will do everything the Lord has told us to do. And the Lord says there in this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 5, well, they've done well to say that, but oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. The essential thing is the heart, and there is a connection between the eyes and the heart. And it is that connection that leads the Lord in the next two verses to give some stern advice on how to resist sexual temptation. Verse 29, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Our Lord was never hesitant to use vivid language and hyperbole in order to stress a point. And here he wasn't suggesting one literally tear out an eye or cut off a hand, but it was a figurative way of urging the necessity of action. He employed the much the same language in Matthew 18 in the context of causing a little one to stumble. Woe to the person who becomes a stumbling block, he says. If it's, not the, if it's the foot or the hand that causes the stumbling, cut it out. If it's the eye, pluck it out. In a parallel way, in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, the topic there is the cost of discipleship. And he said there that if you're going to be my disciple, you must hate your father and your mother and, and children. It was hyperbole he was using to stress the degree of devotion one must have to Christ when compared to the important things that we hold dear in the world. Compared to love for Christ, those relationships should pale in significance. This is mortification he's speaking of. That's the historic term used by theologians to describe the putting to death of the deeds of the flesh that Paul commends in Romans 8, verse 13. If you're living by the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of this body, you will live. A slow and painful process, Charles Hodge said, but worthy of the language the Lord used. Is it your eye? Tear it out. Is it your hand? Cut it off. The right eye the right hand, they were considered the most important of the two. Uh, that's what we talk of a right, my right hand man. We never say my left hand man. Uh, the, Lord is, the Lord is saying, if necessary, you should be willing to take what is most necessary or important to you and remove it from your life. So we must deal drastically with things that lead us to sin. We must take whatever measures are necessary to deal with them. We grasp at language that captures the thought. We eliminate things uh, that lead us to stumble. Uh, what are those things? Now, that's not for the teacher uh, to say. Each of us must be honest with ourselves and face the hard truth. Is it a place? Is it your laptop? Is it certain people? Is it the type of job that you're in? If they cause you to stumble, the Lord says, eliminate them. We run away. That was Paul's advice in another place. Flee immorality. Flee from youthful lust. Be like Joseph and not David. You remember Joseph, uh, Potiphar's wife? He sprinted away from her rather than stay there. Contrast that with David who saw a woman bathing on a terrace and let his eyes linger there. His eye caused him to stumble and he urged it on instead of cutting it off. The scriptures emphasize the perilous relationship between the eyes and the heart, Eve and the Garden of Eden. Saul, remember, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and she took from it and she ate. Achan, in Joshua chapter 7, he had sinned in keeping for himself things under the ban. And that brought about a grave defeat for Israel, and he confessed, I saw, I coveted, I took. Jesus said it's better to cut it off, to pluck it out, than for your whole body to go into hell. Well, we live in a world that scoffs at sin, uh, but Jesus views it differently. 
in his teaching, sin leads to hell. And that's the ultimate reason we should take the drastic measures he recommends. Ultimately, the measures we take to mortify the deeds of the flesh mark us out either as kingdom citizens or as pretenders destined for God's judgment. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul wrote, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. What Jesus taught was that the only righteousness acceptable to God is a divine one that reveals itself in our heart. Let's close in prayer. Father, uh, that's what we all desire. You have made us your own by giving us a new heart. And so may we not be uh, exercisers of hypocritical religion, escapist religion. Rather, let us guard our hearts. Uh, we're totally dependent upon you and give you glory in the way we live our lives. Keep us, Lord. I pray for everyone here that you would keep us from the kind of sin that would make us a stumbling block, that would damage uh, the reputation of our holy God and your wondrous gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.